West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com While many of the January 6 rioters and those threatening members of Congress are being charged, it is significantly much, much harder to prosecute the many Americans who have threatened local election officials in the last year's presidential cycle. Rachel and her team here have covered the landmark journalistic series this year from Reuters, uh, where reporters have cataloged and even published an alarming amount of disturbing threats to election workers all across this country. Today, that team at Reuters is out with yet another report. Uh, this one is entitled Anatomy of a Death Threat that takes a look at 850 threatening messages to election officials and their staff uh, in 16 states after they were falsely accused of voter fraud. From the report, virtually all expressed support for former President Donald Trump or echoed his debunked contention that the election was stolen. Nearly a quarter of those hostile messages suggested the targets should die. Some called for executions. Many uh, called for the target to be investigated, prosecuted, or jailed. Reuters reports that some of those menacing messages included such threats like, you and your family will be killed very slowly. And a message in all caps that read, I know where you sleep. I see you sleeping. Be very afraid, I hope you die. Today, Reuters published a few more of these threatening voicemails to public election officials and workers. And before I play a sample, here's a warning that the voicemails actually contain explicit language. So if you don't want to listen or if you have any kids watching or in the room next to you, you might want to send them out of the room just for a minute. OK, take a listen to this. We will kill you. We will take you out. Your family, your life, and you deserve the throat to the knife. Watch your back. You guys will pay in the end, mother and you guys are dead, mother You are done. This might be a good time to put a pistol in your mouth and pull the trigger. Now, after listening to those, you might assume that all the threats like these, the ones that you just heard there, would actually constitute clear crime, especially if they're being targeted towards officials in this country. But as Reuters explains, building a criminal case for threatening messages is notoriously difficult. The problem the U.S. Supreme Court has not clearly defined a true threat. For instance, many prosecutors would consider the phrase, I will kill you, as a clear threat, but you should die as legally protected free speech. Reuters gives an example from one of the messages, which in part reads, quote, she cheated and she knows she cheated and she should be shot for treason. So my question to you at home is this, is that A, a threat, or B, protected speech? Reuters has the interactive for you, which shows that according to legal scholars, such a message, although it is threatening, does not constitute a true threat because it doesn't show clear intent. 
Now, over 100 of these calls sampled by Reuters appeared to meet the federal threshold for prosecution, yet arrests, well, they have been rare. Since the 2020 election, Reuters found just four cases, four cases that were prosecuted. Joining us now is the lead reporter on that incredibly fascinating report uh, from Reuters out today, Peter Eisler. Uh, He's a national affairs correspondent at Reuters. Mr. Eisler, thank you so much for being here. And more importantly, thank you and your team for this incredible and just absolutely eye-opening report that shows where we are as a country right now. I I know the team at Reuters has done this job, amazing job of cataloging, cataloging, excuse me, 850 uh, threatening calls to election officials and staffers. But uh, as we noted, these are just the calls found by Reuters in 16 states. Do we have any sense, any idea how widespread these threats are? No, we really don't. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Um, and uh, no, there has not been any sort of systematic effort to gather these kinds of threats and hostile messages and menacing messages from around the country. And we went out and we focused on places where uh, former President Trump and his supporters and uh, some of the media outlets that have been particularly friendly to him and to his claims of a rigged election have, have focused their allegations of voter fraud. So we looked at particular places in Arizona and in Georgia and in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and and a number of other states. Uh, We did not go around and survey every county or even every state in the country. And as far as I know, uh, the threats and the messages that we've collected, that's the biggest sample that exists right now. Do you know if anybody in the federal government is trying to, you know, follow your investigation or perhaps conduct an investigation of their own where they have a central repository of this information? So we've been doing these stories uh, over the last several months. And back in June, after we began doing work on this, the Justice Department put a task force together to focus on threats against election workers, state and local election workers. To date, that task force, uh, to our knowledge, has not made any arrests. Uh, They haven't announced any arrests. And um, whether they have, you know, gone out and systematically collected threats and hostile messages from all over the country, I don't believe so. If they have, they haven't said anything about it. Um, And many of the election workers that we've spoken with, and we've spoken with scores of them have said that they have gone to the FBI and brought them threats or referred Mm. threats to them uh, that they were worried about. And the FBI has taken them and said that they're investigating, but they haven't really heard back in many cases, most cases. What, if anything, uh, Peter, can you tell us about what kind of people are making these threats? I mean, I know you're dealing with a large number here, but have you been able to sample their backgrounds? Where are they from? Uh, What do they do beyond just their motivations? So we, uh, you know, many of these things are anonymous. Uh, And what we were able to, for example, identify a gender in 500 plus of these messages and overwhelmingly male, four out of five of the messages uh, where we were able to identify the gender were were people, were obviously male. Um, We found that a substantial number of these cases, uh, the threatener was contacting officials in a state other than the place where they live. Um, so, you know, out of 74 uh, cases where we were actually able to identify where the, the person who sent the message was from, um, 32 of those cases, uh, the person who sent the message was not in the same state as the person they sent it to. And then we found a relatively small number of people who are for lack of a better term, sort of frequent flyers, people who are sending these hostile messages (laughs) again and again to people all over the country. Um, And we found, you know, about 10 of those people who had sent at least 10 of these messages out. And they were responsible for about 180 of the 850 plus messages that we collected. Uh, In some cases, they would target the same official and just send that person message after message. In other cases, they would, you know, send messages to an array of officials, either in one state or even in some cases in multiple places. What do you know about the people receiving these threats, the officials, and why those individuals particularly? 
Well, the common denominator is that the people who tend to get large numbers of these really hostile messages are people who have pushed back on false allegations of election fraud or voter fraud. So in some of the places where President Trump and his allies have been most aggressive in contesting the results, so Maricopa County, Arizona, where you have a, a Republican-dominated board of supervisors, um, you know, in that case, it was Republicans that were really coming under heavy attack, uh, you know, being called rhinos, which is you know sort of a derisive term for Republicans in name only, right. because they would push back and say, well, no, we've done multiple audits, we've done recounts, we have, you know, verified the security and the veracity of the results of these elections, you know, up one side and down the other, and the election is solid and it's sound. And yeah. really, that is what earns you kind of the ire of these people that are sending these things. So. You know, in Fulton County, Georgia, which is another place that's taken a lot of heat, you know, that's a Democratic county. And yeah. uh, you're seeing a lot of Democrats in Maricopa County, Arizona. It's a Republican dominated county. But again, sort of the same phenomenon. You're seeing the same thing. It is Friday, the 31st of December of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, which is very apt because it is New Year's Eve. Now, be careful. Always drink with friends. And, uh, uh, you know, have someone that uh, isn't, isn't drinking. Because if you can find one. Otherwise, stay at home. All right? And even then... With the French 77, which is the cocktail du jour, and actually the special cocktail on Fridays, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Do take care. It is a potent spirit. Well, Happy New Year. Uh, will it be? <laughs> we'll find out, won't we? And uh, already I noticed that the anti-vaxxers are uh, gearing up for the weekend. Even on our little uh, Rogue River, Oregon Facebook town page. We call it the town page. It's not really anything to do with the actual town council. Uh, but this particular one is able to influence, and it does. And I'll tell you how. Is that according to the terms of use, you know, the group rules, uh, politics are not supposed to be, you know, bandi bandied about. And neither is COVID. So I think the administrator had been on vacation for the holidays because there was all sorts of BS political stuff and all sorts of disinformation about COVID and the vaccines and the wearing of masks. I mean, almost three, we're going on three years here. All right. And these people are still doing this BS after my mom got sick. They don't care how many people died. It's all, it, they, they think it's all made up. Because they are immature, childish actors. It doesn't matter to them because it's not happening to them. And even if it does, they can deny it is. Oh, it's anthrax. That's not COVID, it's anthrax. And no amount of reasoning no amount of evidence matters. Anything apparently to do with uh, liberal America is Satan. I was called a Satan worshiper. You know, those, those are those kinds of words can get somebody killed. And yet that goes on. And uh, I post, you know, I post very little there. And uh, but I feel it is a civic duty to sort of push back a little bit. Because these people are bullies. So uh, somebody had put up another disinfo anti-vaccine BS. And also, you know, the uh, let's go Brandon uh, meme. All that can keep going on. But as soon as someone deemed a liberal makes a comment in opposition not only will that, 
shut down the comments. The admin will shut down the comments finally. But then he calls you out. It's a, it, it is crazy. Like, you know better not to make a comment on these things. Well, why are all of, all of them up and they're not taken down? And the comments are open and everybody's making comments in advocacy of this bullshit. This Facebook group was responsible for a near race riot in this town. To the point that the town council had to admonish the Facebook page for riling up the neighborhood. And yet, I am admonished by the administrator for, what, stoking the fires? I don't care. We punch the Nazis any way we can. And if this little petty burgermeister thinks that, oh, well, it's all just a joke, we can just, like, live without it. While at the same time advocating by sympathy, tacit approval, being the good Republicans like the good Germans of old. Shaming anyone who would say, you know, this is a Nazi uprising. The Nazis first of all, aren't at the point now, especially the sympathizers, where they can say, hey, yeah, that's a good thing. They're still remaining a little quiet. They think it's it's still their secret. Except the secret's been out for a long time. And I'll tell you, Hillary was not only right in 2016. She was right way back in the early 90s when she mentioned and everybody guffawed, oh, a vast right-wing conspiracy, and we all saw it. She was correct then, and she's correct now. We saw the right-wing money groups arising during the Reagan years. The Federalist Society, Heritage Foundation, the, uh, the uh, Falwell Uprising. Right? All of that. We saw that then. Hillary called it exactly what it was. And they all laughed. Oh, stupid, crazy liberal. They're all into their conspiracies. Yeah, well, some people go to jail for conspiracy, right? So it wasn't like a conspiracy theory. It was a fact of legal conspiratorial efforts to bring down the United States of America. They took the Soviet plan. If it takes us 50 years, we'll do it. That's why you got people like Bannon talking about, you know, Leninist BS. It's the same thing. If it takes 50 years, hey, you know, make the effort. And they do. And we think that when we've survived a battle, somehow we've won and we can sit on our, sit on our laurels. Oh, okay, everything's fine now. Everybody's free. We all got free speech. Uh, race isn't an issue anymore because we elected a black president. Which actually activated the bigots and racists in this country and made them into full-blown Nazis. We all forget about that. This is our punishment for not only electing the black guy once, we elected him twice. That's why we have these uh, parents, apparently, telling us kids, us, we irresponsible children, what, you're trying to be friends with that? We won't allow it. Well, you know what? These so-called parents are stunted. They're maldeveloped. And we certainly don't want to be parented by that type, do we? They're abusive. I think there might need to have an intervention. We got Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about a national divorce. Whatever Democrats do, they got to wait for a while and then they got to pay for their sins. You know what, B? We are not the sinners in this construct. And I'm telling you, that's not God on your side. 
If you notice the flicking tail, because we do. How is this person and her ilk still able to be seated in the well of Congress, in the seat of government? It's right there in the Constitution. They voted against seating electors right after they called it a riot, the insurrection. And I know when I say right after, I mean when they were able to clear the capital capital out so they could sit down and take a vote for the peaceful transition of power. And a hundred of them or more were all in cahoots, voted against seating the electors. How is that advancing the cause of democracy? That is advancing the destruction of democracy. And when Marjorie Taylor Greene and her ilk talk about that national divorce and the free movement of liberals and Democrats must be curtailed and they must pay for their sins, that's Nazi talk. And then they whine, say that, oh, look, at it's the Gestapo making people uh, leave that restaurant because they didn't have their vac- vaccine cards. No. Floating ideas like uh, curtailing the free movement of someone because of their political affiliation, that is being the Gestapo. Not protecting public health. All right. Happy New Year. <laughs> Let's. Uh, yeah. Okay. I guess. I guess we're gonna try to be happy, even though we have some uh, stories of warning for the new year. At the top, of course. I. I we. We. We've been aware of this, but it's uh, good to see it now codified by an actual deep dive investigative journalistic uh, uh, endeavor. And the Reuters issued an investigative report that found that most threats against election workers stoked by Trump's big lie go unpunished. I, you know, personally, I don't get it. If you, it, <laughs> they can say, I want you dead, but that's not a threat. They, that, that's a First Amendment right to say that. I want you dead. I, I got to tell you, I've been uh, now, of course, you know, we don't make those sorts of threats. So it's funny how we can be punished, you know, the little 30 day suspensions uh, off of Facebook, for instance. For simply telling someone, someone who said, I want you dead. And if you say STFU, you're the bully. You report their threat and you get the uh, notice back. Oh, well, that doesn't violate our terms of use. Community standards. Well, that says it right there. Community standards, right? Right. On the rest of the menu, the New Jersey Supreme Court revived a gender bias suit brought by a former town manager. The CDC warned people not to go on cruises regardless of their vaccination status. Yeah, you want to be in a Petri dish? You will be. And U.S. unemployment claims dropped to 198,000, the lowest since 1969, which just goes to prove Joe and the Dems are in disarray. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Russian authorities designated a member of the Pussy Riot punk rock group, yes, Nadia, as a foreign agent. And Germany is pulling the plug on three of its last six nuclear power plants. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
near the bottom of our homepage at netflixradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by the Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room, the link there near the bottom of our homepage at netroomsradio.com to the left is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink, for instance, if you could send those funds to us once a month, it really helps us uh, pay our bills and uh, continue with the continuous upgrading of hardware and software that uh, <laughs> looks like it's required because of the m- market of planned obsolescence. Uh, that Well, it's needed to keep this powerhouse of resistance resisting the hostile takeover of the United States of America. And we thank you for your generosity in all these many years, and thank you in advance for your generosity in the future, near or distant. All kidding aside, uh, we do uh, appreciate all the uh, the feedback, emotional and monetary, <laughs> that we have gotten. It uh, sustains us and really does. It really does help us uh, continue this this well endeavor that we call Netroots Radio. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. You just go to at Netroots Radio. And thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Happy New Year to crew and family. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, it, in fact, I would suggest it. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary, incidentally, on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. You know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please, please, please pick up podcasts. By way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. All right. This first offering here uh, on New Year's Eve day. Mm-hmm. It's still the it's still daytime, at least here. Is out of the Associated Press by well anonymous staff because it is the holidays. A former Northern New Jersey township manager who claims she was fired because of her gender after a run in with the town's police chief had her case revived by the state Supreme Court. And that was uh, yesterday, Thursday. The unanimous ruling, unanimous, reversed two lower courts that had ruled against Michelle Meade in her suit against Livingston Township. Meade whom Thursday's filing said was the only female town manager in Livingston's history and the only town manager to be terminated involuntarily, claimed she was fired in 2016 and replaced with a male manager to appease the town's male police chief, whom she feuded. The town claimed Meade was fired due to poor work performance Meade is seeking compensation for lost wages and benefits and damage to her reputation as well as punitive damages. I don't think they mean damage to the punitive damages. She wants punitive damages as well. Thursday's ruling sent the matter back to a lower court for trial. Ms. Mead and I are very grateful the Supreme Court saw that an injustice had occurred and that the case should be presented to a jury, her attorney, Christopher Lenzo, said. It's an important decision in terms of recognizing that sometimes biased subordinates can actually undermine the employment of their supervisors. Juan Fernandez, an attorney representing Livingston, said he and the town respect the decision of the Supreme Court but declined. Further comment. According to Thursday's filing, Meade and former police chief Craig Hanschuch had a contentious working relationship centered around Hanschuch's performance. In one incident in 2013, preschool teachers saw a man with a gun or saw a man with a gun and a bag walking through a parking lot next to a community center and called police. 
Hans, Hans Chuch alerted the responders that it was a training exercise and that the man was an officer. An independent investigation faulted him and the emergency services unit for failing to communicate about the exercise. Over time, according to the filing, the relationship deteriorated and Meade discussed discipline, disciplining Hans Chuch to the, with the town council. Meade claimed that the town's mayor, who also served on that council, suggested to her that, quote, maybe Chief Hans Chuch does not like reporting to a woman and should report to him as mayor instead, according to the filing. This is 2016. We're not talking 1956 now. 2016. Another council member testified he told other members that Meade wouldn't be having problems with a chief if her name was Michael, though one of the other council members testified he considered the comment a joke. It's always a joke when you get caught. Come on, we're guys, we know that. Well, some of us are. An appeals court concluded that any discrimination against Meade came from below referring to Han Judge, and that Meade had the authority to eliminate the problem herself since she had the authority, authority to suspend or dismiss Han Judge. In its ruling yesterday, Thursday, the Supreme Court disagreed, writing that although the council members alleged a member of areas of dissatisfaction with Meade's performance, a reasonable jury could conclude that Meade's gender played a role in the council's termination of her employment. Adriana gomez Lison of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits, New Year's Eve Fridays. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned people not to go on cruises regardless of their vaccination status because of onboard outbreaks fueled by the Omicron variant. The CD set. CDC said it has more than 90, that's a 9-0, cruise ships under investigation or observation as a result of COVID-19 cases, and the agency did not disclose the number of infections. But we're talking 90 cruise ships. The virus that causes COVID-19 spreads easily between people in close quarters on board ships and the chance of getting COVID-19 on cruise ships is very high, even if people are fully vaccinated and have received a booster, the CDC said. The Cruise Lines International Association said it was disappointed with the new recommendations, saying the industry was singled out, despite the fact it follows stricter health protocols in other travel sectors. Well, you know what? People are still getting sick, aren't they? The CDC on Thursday also recommended that passengers get tested and quarantined for five days after docking, regardless of their vaccination status, and even if they have no symptoms. Omicron has sent cases skyrocketing to unprecedented levels across the U.S., including Florida, the hub of the nation's cruise industry. The state set another record this week with new daily cases with more than 58,000 recorded on Wednesday alone. U.S. cruise lines have not announced any plans to halt trips, though vessels have been denied entry at some foreign ports.
Paul Weisman of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell below 200,000. More evidence that the job market remains strong in the aftermath of last year's coronavirus recession. Jobless claims dropped by 8,000 to 198,000, the Labor Department reported yesterday, you know Thursday. The four-week average, which smooths out week-to-week volatility, fell to just above 199,000, the lowest level since October of 1969. I was, oh, I guess I would have been a freshman in high school then. Okay. The numbers suggest that the fast-spreading Omicron variant has yet to trigger a wave of layoffs. Although 1.7 million Americans were collecting traditional unemployment aid the week that ended December 18th, that was the lowest since March of 2020, just as the pandemic was starting to slam the U.S. economy and down by 140,000 from the week before. The weekly claims numbers, a proxy for layoffs, have fallen steadily most of the year. Employers are reluctant to let workers go at a time when it's tough to find replacements. The U.S. had a near-record 11 million job openings in October, and 4.2 million Americans quit their jobs, just off September's record of 4.4 million because there are so many opportunities. The job market has bounced back from last year's brief but intense coronavirus recession when COVID hit. Governments ordered lockdowns, consumers hunkered down at home, and many businesses closed or cut back hours. Employers slashed more than 22 million jobs in March and April of 2020, and the unemployment rate rocketed to 14.8%. But massive government spending and eventually the rollout of vaccines brought the economy back. Employers have added 18 and a half million jobs since April of 2020, still leaving the U.S. with 3.9 million jobs short of what it had before the pandemic. The December jobs report out next week is expected to show that the economy generated another 374,000 jobs this month. The unemployment rate has fallen to 4.2%, close to what economists consider full employment, which just proves Joe just can't get things done. And the Dems are in disarray. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be hearing that on mainstream media for at least another week or two. I would presume that to be so. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetRootsRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, the man behind the mask. Spider-Man No Way Home takes one of my least favorite superhero comics tropes, the alternate dimension incursion, and handles it much better than I ever imagined it could or would. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to spend a minute 40 talking about Willem Dafoe, with a three-second spoiler at the end, which I will warn you about. Now, Dafoe is not just a movie actor, but also a hardcore theater actor. In fact, back in the 70s, he was a founding member of the famous New York experimental theater company, The Worcester Group. Look it up. The man is experienced, he is good, he's a national treasure. So, way back in 2002, when Sony did their first Spider-Man movie, Willem Dafoe played the dual personality Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin. Now, in the comics, the Goblin wears a creepy rubber mask that can move like a real face because, you know, comic book physics. 
So the Sony production hired special effects studio Amalgamated Dynamics, which created an animatronic mask. And it worked, it moved, it was creepy, but for reasons still shrouded in time, the production heads ditched it and went with the disappointing, unimpressive static faceplate that Defoe wore in the film. So when early on in Spider-Man No Way Home, we see Defoe smash the faceplate in a reassertion of the Osborne personality, I thought, a little nod to the fans who've hated that thing, and, oh cool, maybe now we get a real Green Goblin mask. But we don't. We get something better. What we get is Defoe transitioning between Norman Osborn and the Green Goblin using just his own weird, expressive, intense face, using just his considerable power as an actor, and Defoe throws down a Jekyll and Hyde like an artist unleashed. It's awesome. And it turns out, it's important for Spider-Man No Way Home to give Osborn Goblin a human face, since the character turns out to be, and here's the spoiler, the heart of a movie that's an allegorical treatment of alternative criminal engagement, or, if you will, defunding the super police. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeToMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Just like cows, sheep, and bison roam the earth in herds today, so too did plant-eating dinosaurs, and it appears they began flocking together much earlier than we used to think, just as the Jurassic period was beginning to unfold. This is really a critical time in the evolution of dinosaurs. This is pretty early on. So the idea is that this type of social behavior may actually contribute to the evolutionary success of dinosaurs. Jahan Ramazani of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is a geochronologist. In his words, I date things, and I date old things, things in the millions and billions of years, not, not the really young stuff. In this case, Ramazani was dating tiny zircon crystals embedded in a fossil bed in Patagonia, near the southern tip of South America. Those crystals dated back to nearly 193 million years ago. And the fossils preserved there, an array of nearly 200 specimens of a plant eater named Musaurus patagonicus, provide a snapshot of a dinosaur at all stages of its life. Eggs and hatchlings, clumps of juveniles, and then further out, adults. So this kind of uh, undisturbed distribution of fossils and this kind of age segregation basically shows that these dinosaurs had, had a, uh, a kind of a social structure. They lived in a colony. and. Uh, Everybody has got things to do, duties with respect to the youngs and, and the juveniles. The study in the journal Scientific Reports suggests dinosaurs developed complex social behavior 40 million years earlier than we used to think. And Ramazani says the work also advances long standing questions about the social structure of dinosaurs. Was it more like primitive? Taxa, like the crocodiles, or look like the more evolved types of animals like birds and mammals. And we are beginning to see that, yes, it, it looks more like a mammal or more like a bird type colony. Whatever type of social structure it was, the scientists hypothesized that it helped large plant eating dinosaurs first spread across the planet, kickstarting tens of millions of years of dominion on Earth. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, 
Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. At the Supreme Court, what's the shadow docket? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Mention the Supreme Court, and you probably envision a deliberative, thoughtful process that begins with the list of cases that the justices will decide that term. It's docket. Cases thoroughly litigated, for example, after a federal district court trial and lengthy review by a court of appeals, followed by extensive briefing and oral argument at the high court itself, and then an opinion with all votes and reasoning publicly disclosed. It's a process designed to appear thoughtful and transparent, in a word, judicial. But now, with increasing frequency, the court is plucking cases for decision from its shadow docket, which operates differently from what we've just described. Although a mechanism for dealing with emergencies has existed since the court's inception, this court's shadow docket is different. Cases on the shadow docket have not had the same deliberative process, and the shadow docket is being used more frequently and consequentially for decisions on, for example, the death penalty, abortion, immigration, and COVID-19 safety restrictions. The shadow docket cases can be a rush to judgment that ends in a decision a sentence or two long with no name of any justice attached. The Supreme Court's extensive use of the shadow docket is problematic because it undermines the public's faith in the court at a time in its and the country's history when the court needs to be seen as operating in the sunshine and not in the shadows. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Voting rights in colonial America depended on the ownership of property. In other words, a person had to own a certain amount of land, livestock, or other property in order to qualify to vote. One of the key purposes of government for the colonists was the protection of property. So, some Americans thought that it was reasonable to predicate voting rights on the ownership of property, typically owning at least 50 acres of land. Land was easier to obtain in America than in Britain. In fact, indentured servants were sometimes awarded land once their term of indenture was up. In practice, however, only male property owners of accepted Protestant denominations were, in most cases, allowed to vote. This amounted to less than 20% of the population. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. In 1972, I was part of a nationwide campaign that came close to getting the U.S. Senate to reject Earl Butts. Richard Nixon's choice for Secretary of Agriculture. A coalition of grassroots farmers, consumers, and public interest organizations teamed up with progressive senators to undertake the almost impossible challenge of defeating the cabinet nominee. The 51 to 44 Senate vote was so close because we were able to expose butts as, well, as butt ugly. We brought the abusive power of corporate agribusiness into the public consciousness for the first time. We had won a moral victory. But it turned out to be a curse and a blessing. First, the curse. Butts had risen to prominence in the world of agriculture by devoting himself to the corporate takeover of the global food economy. He openly promoted the preeminence of middlemen food manufacturers over family farmers. Agriculture is no longer a way of life, he barked. It's a business. He instructed farmers to get big or get out and proceeded to shove tens of thousands of them out by promoting an export-based, corporate-run food economy. Adapt, he warned, or die. The ruination of farms and rural communities, Butts added, releases people to do something useful in our society. This is Jim Hightower saying, the curse of Butts, however, spun off a blessing. Small farmers and food artisans practically threw up at the resulting twinkieization of America's food, They were sickened that nature's own contribution to human culture was being turned into another plasticized product of corporate profiteers. They threw themselves into creating and sustaining a viable alternative, linking locally with consumers, environmentalists, community activists, marketers, and others, 
the Good Food Rebellion has since sprouted, spread, and blossomed from coast to coast. To find farmers markets and other expressions of this movement right where you live, go to localharvest.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1891. That was the day that an Irish teenager by the name of Annie Moore arrived on the shores of New York. She was traveling with her two younger brothers. They had taken a 12-day sea voyage to be reunited with their parents, who were already in New York City. The next morning, Annie became the first person to enter the United States through the immigration station at Ellis Island. 700 immigrants passed through Ellis Island that day. Over the next five decades, they would be joined by more than 12 million. The facilities at Ellis Island closed in 1954. It is estimated that more than one-third of U.S. citizens can trace at least one relative back to Ellis Island. Many of those who came to Ellis were fleeing poverty or war in Eastern and Southern Europe. When arriving at the immigration center, they had to undergo rigorous health screenings and interviews. Sometimes they would have to wait for hours or days for their turn to be inspected. If they failed the inspection, they would have to wait for their case to be reviewed. Sometimes the wait stretched on for weeks. For some, the process ended with a decision to deport them back to Europe. In the early years of operation, immigrants often had to deal with exploitation at the hands of screeners at Ellis. Screeners would demand bribes or sexual favors. President Teddy Roosevelt moved to clean up the corruption. The immigrants who came through Ellis Island helped to build the labor force of the United States. From New York, they went on to work in industries across the nation. On the first day of January, 1892, opened Ellis Island and they let the people through. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits, New Year's Eve Friday. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Where we continue under a winter weather advisory. And our temperature at the moment is 34 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting uh, the forecast to be nearly the same as far as temperature as it was yesterday. And we had a tremendous amount of melt from the uh, piled up snow that was everywhere. And it looks like our forecast for snow is being downgraded. We will have a mixture of rain and snow today, though it seems like mostly light rain. And winds will be light and variable. Partly cloudy skies tonight. Oh, our highs today will be in the upper 30s. Uh, Cloudy skies tonight, partly. It will give way to completely cloudy skies late. Lows around 25 degrees Fahrenheit, winds light and variable. And then on New Year's Day, intervals of clouds and sunshine, highs in the upper 30s. We do have an increase in infections and deceased in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon. We have now risen to 266,040 confirmed cases, and our deceased have risen by three and now stand at 390. Pollen is rated as none outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is good at 26 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at level one. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.95 inches. Visibility is down to one mile and relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 58 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 59 and cloudy. Rome is 63 and sunny. 
Kiev is 35 degrees with fog. Kabul is 36 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 60 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 33 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 72 and clear. San Francisco, California is 40 degrees and clear with a temperature. I guess you're going to have low temps and it looks like some more rain. And New York, New York is 51 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy on New Year's Eve day. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russian authorities yesterday, Thursday, designated a member of the Pussy Riot punk group, a satirist, and an art collector as foreign agents, part of efforts to stifle dissent. The Justice Ministry applied the label to Nadia a Pussy Riot member who became widely known for taking part in a 2012 protest inside Moscow's Christ the Savior Cathedral, after which she spent nearly two years in prison. Journalist and satirist Viktor Shandorovich and art collector Merit Gelman were also handed the label, along with several other people. Those designated as foreign agents are required to add a lengthy statement to news reports, social media posts, and other materials specifying that the content was created by a foreign agent. And earlier this week, Russia's court shut the country's oldest and most prominent human rights group, Memorial, citing its failure to identify itself as a foreign agent. Nadia said in a public statement she would challenge the authorities' decision in court, concluding, Russia will be free. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Anonymous staff at Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits New Year's Eve Fridays Germany will pull the plug on three of its last nuclear power stations today. Another step towards completing its withdrawal from nuclear power as it focuses on a return to renewables. The government decided to speed up its phasing out of nuclear power following Japan's Fukushima reactor meltdown in 2011 when an earthquake and tsunami destroyed the coastal plant in the world's worst Disaster since Chernobyl 25 years earlier. They were the reactors of Brockdorf, Grund, and Gundermingen, run by utilities Eon and RWE, will be shut down today after three and a half decades in operation. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, the week, and the year. But you do know we'll meet up on Monday. The new year for River City Hash Monday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon ami.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 